Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Heiser, scholar in residence at Faith Life, and with me today is Dr. Daryl Bach of Dallas Seminary. Daryl and I are going to talk about my book, The Unseen Realm. I, I think what I want to do is hear the story of what in the world caused you to write a book <laughs> right. on the other realm. Well, I, I actually re relate a little of that in the first chapter. Uh, I was in grad school at Wisconsin, and at that time I taught undergraduate biblical studies for five years. It's went very back to cold do my in Wisconsin, program. isn't it? And it so is. It makes you think about things, yeah. right? Well, it, 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 that's, that's one way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me think about leaving, really. <laughs> yeah. But I was, I was just sitting there in church, you know, killing a little bit of time before the service, and there was a friend of mine who was in the Hebrew department as well, and I don't remember what we were talking about, but I remember, and I'll never forget how the conversation ended. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy pulled out his Hebrew Bible, flipped it to Psalm 82 and said, here, read that. And I did, and it, there it is, just, just boom, right in my face, you know, Elohim Nitzav Ba'adat El. God stands in, his, in the divine council, takes his stand in the divine council, and then the next line is, Be'ker of Elohim Yishpot, in the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at that and thinking, that sounds like a pantheon. Mm -hmm. How in the world have I never seen that before? Mm -hmm. And I don't remember a word of the sermon, <laughs> but I, I just, I, I kept chewing on this and it was like my second year in, in graduate school. And, you know, I'd, I'd taken a couple years of seminary. I'd, I'd taught, you know, five years biblical studies. I had a really strong background and I had never seen that before. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of disturbed me. Mm -hmm. But then when I got into it, it eventually became sort of a focus of my doctoral work and my dissertation and whatnot to sort of resolve this issue because I'm thinking, hey, Jesus knew this. Mm -hmm. The apostles knew this. None of this is news. Right, right. You know, there, so there has to be some way of parsing this, even though within evangelical circles, I had just been totally unaware of this. Mm -hmm. And that became my mission. And once I was into that and really started to see, okay, there's this whole way of thinking about the unseen realm that, mm -hmm. you know, is familiar with critical scholars, mm -hmm. but is really totally off the radar when it comes to evangelicals. And it has a lot of payoffs in a whole lot of passages. And I thought, it just isn't right for me to sit here and sort of enjoy this and mm -hmm. kind of noodle this and see where it, again, has interpretive value. And I thought, you know, I need to do something that takes biblical scholarship in this arena, specifically with the unseen realm, what we think of as angels mm -hmm. and demons, which is a whole lot more right. variegated. And I need to di make it digestible. I need to make that material decipherable for the average person so that they can see the payoff and sort of appreciate the, 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 the meta-narrative, the arc through Scripture of how the worlds intersect with each other. You know, the as in heaven, so below mm -hmm. sort of motif that just r tracks all the way through both Testaments. And so that sort of became the genesis, even though I didn't realize it at the moment. Mm -hmm of what was going to become Unseen Realm. Okay, let me ask one more question that's kind of a background question, then we'll get into the content of the book. Um, and that is, you said you wrote your dissertation as kind of a, really is the backdrop for this book. So tell us a little bit about what that was about sure. and then go from there. Yeah, my, my dissertation really is something that, for people who read the book, if they get around the, the chapters that deal with what I refer to in the book as the two Yahweh's mm -hmm. idea, the, the concept of a Godhead mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. in Israelite religion. Because when I was doing divine counsel research, I began to notice that there are these relationships between the way the Canaanites saw things, mm -hmm. El and Baal, you know, a, a sort mm -hmm. of a two-tiered system. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Israelites are not mm -hmm. going to have a second deity. Right. All right, but what they did was they sort of brought over the structure mm -hmm. and then they filled the two slots with the unseen Yahweh and a visible Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And that way they could maintain a, a monotheistic outlook, mm -hmm. but still organize things the way their culture you know, made, made it familiar. And so I wound up then arguing for a Godhead in Israelite religion with a Jewish advisor, mm. which was really interesting. It was a tap dance the whole yeah, way. Yeah, I can imagine. But to his credit, you know, he allowed me to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I was arguing, hey, this is the backdrop. This is the Semitic backdrop mm -hmm. to what we think of as high Christology mm -hmm. and ultimately a trinity because it does work out with a third person eventually. But that became my dissertation and that's part of the book. 
but it was it was an interesting exercise to get through. Okay, now part of what you do in the book is to say, you, even if you've thought about this realm, that some of what you're dealing with are not the normal ways people will think about this. So let me walk through what I think is the normal way people put this together who mm -hmm. have thought about it a little bit and let you react. And that is, yes, there's divine counsel in the Old Testament, and there's this interaction with the counsel of whatever it is that's the, the, made up of the transcendent beings in which God you know, is obviously the, the chief of, of whatever this counsel is. But the Old Testament really doesn't do that much with angels and demons. I mean, we get the angel of the Lord, we get Satan showing up in Job, but basically there's not that much going on until you get to apocalyptic literature. When you start to hit apocalyptic literature, then you begin to see opening up a world of angels. Uh, you know, you get Michael and Daniel and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then it's in the Second Temple period, in the intertestament, what evangelicals would call the intertestamental period, but often it's called Second Temple mm -hmm. Judaism, in which you get this explosion of detail about angels and demons and how they work and what's going on. And the New Testament comes along and picks up what's, what's also happened in the interim as mm -hmm. a part of what they're doing. Now, how is that for a sketch, or is it just too thin a sketch? What's going on? I think that's, other than the beginning, because most people have not heard of divine counsel mm -hmm. uh, in evangelical circles, but other than that, I think that's pretty fair. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, there are a number of disconnects with it. Uh, one of the first things is with this whole idea of, of a council. It's just, it's academies for the heavenly host. Right, okay? right, That's right. all it is. But it's a metaphor for administration. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to really, you know, object to that. The, the sticking point is when you look at it the way uh, a Semite would, mm -hmm. and the biblical writer uses the word Elohim for half a dozen different Mm -hmm. entities other mm -hmm. than the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. That alone tells you, mm -hmm. or should tell you, that Elohim is not a word that is it's equated. It's not inherently monotheistic. Right. It's not inherently, uh, I would say it's not, it's not inherently gravitated toward or defined by a specific set of unique attributes. Mm -hmm. Because when we see G-O-D, mm -hmm. we mentally assign a set of attributes mm -hmm. to it. But when the biblical writer wrote Elohim, mm -hmm. they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is they're using it of, of a variety of things. And so we have to sort of adjust the way we think of that term, again, have them in, in our head. And that sort of opens the door to what, again, scholars would refer to as divine plurality. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, then you start to start, you start to think about, okay, well, what about the roles mm -hmm. of, of some of these entities? Now, you brought up uh, the, the angel of the Lord, the Malach Adonai, mm -hmm. it's the only uh, entity that is identified with Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So that alone is significant because mm -hmm. Yahweh to an Israelite, to an Orthodox mm -hmm. Israelite, would be an Elohim. Mm -hmm. There's lots of Elohim, mm -hmm. but only one Elohim is him. Mm -hmm. he is, there's none like him. There's he is none the right. Elohim. He is unique. Yeah. And he's, he's not unique because of a word mm -hmm. like Elohim. He's unique because of the way the biblical writers describe him. Mm -hmm. He's the lone creator, he's the lone sovereign, you know, all these things that we associate in systematic theology with. Yeah, theology when the New proper. Testament describes this God in the list of the plethora of gods, though it's a the most high. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean there there are ways to telegraph yeah. that this yeah. one is different than all the others. Right. And they do that. Uh, so when you identify that unique one mm -hmm. with this specific agent, mm -hmm. this specific angel, again, that is important and significant because of the way those two characters uh, will appear and interact with each other, sometimes in the same scene. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite passages is Genesis 48, 15, and 16, which is really obscure. Mm -hmm. But it's when Jacob is blessing Joseph's children. We all know the mm -hmm. story, you know, they cross mm -hmm. their arms and mm -hmm. all that. But that's about all we know. If mm -hmm. you, you look at what he says. Mm -hmm. He says, may the God, and it's ha Elohim, mm -hmm. may the God who, you know, protected me mm -hmm. all my life. And then the second line is, may the God who blessed me, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And then the third stanza is, may the angel. And then the following verb is singular in Hebrew, mm -hmm. may he bless these boys. Mm -hmm. Now, if the writer wanted to separate mm -hmm. and distinguish for mm -hmm. theology's sake, mm -hmm. just use a plural verb, but it doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so you're left with, well, is it one or the other? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah. Okay, because, again, just like we talk about Jesus, well, Jesus is God, but he's not the Father, so he is, but he, it's the same sort of mentality, the same sort of thought categories going back there. So that's another difference. The, so you brought up Satan. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone who takes Hebrew sort of gets into Hebrew grammar realizes that Satan, Satan, mm -hmm. 
in the Hebrew Bible when it's accompanied with a definite article, the word the, mm -hmm. ha, satan in mm -hmm. Hebrew, is not a proper name because Hebrew does not put the in front of proper names like English. Mm -hmm. You're not the Daryl. Yeah. I'm not the Mike. I not just, yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say apologies to Donald Trump. You know, that's right. The Donald. That's right. <laughs> but I mean, normally that's not the case. Yeah. You know? and, and so Hebrew is the same way. Mm -hmm. And so the Satan mm -hmm. is a character in the divine court as a specific role, mm -hmm. uh, means the adversary. You mm -hmm. know, John Walton's done a lot of stuff on this, mm -hmm. and study Bibles will tell you this. Mm -hmm. but. We don't really think about that, that there's this, this disconnect, you know, so how do we get from the enemy in Genesis 3 to the New Testament where, you know, the, Satan is a proper noun? Well, mm. there is a trajectory, and I, mm. I discuss that in the book, and mm. the term fits because it's an adversarial relationship. Sure. But you start to, to sort of pick at these things, and the characters aren't quite what we thought they were, and they're not doing what, what we thought they do. There's participatory governan you know, governance. Mm -hmm. First Kings 22, mm -hmm. God has decreed, hey, it's time for Ahab to go. Mm -hmm. Time for Ahab to die. Let's get rid of this guy. And then he says, well, this is, what I, this is what's going to happen. He's mm -hmm. going to die, but how do we get this done? Mm -hmm. And he leaves it to the heavenly host mm -hmm. called spirits mm -hmm. in that passage to decide. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, one says this, one says that, one steps forward and says, I got it, I got it. I'll be a, a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And God more or less says, yeah, that'll work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daniel, this you know, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Right. Okay, where he's going to go insane and all this bad stuff's going to happen to him. The, the Holy One, the Watcher, says, This is by decree of the Watchers, mm -hmm. plural. Mm -hmm. But then a few verses later, this is by decree of the Most High. Mm -hmm. So it's not that God is being usurped in any way, but it's this collective participatory thing. And that's actually normal. Mm -hmm. We don't think of it as normal in, in evangelical theology, but that's what God does with us. Mm -hmm. You say, well, God doesn't need a council. Well, he doesn't need us either. Mm -hmm. But he decides to use the agents, the beings he's created that you know, share his attributes. Intelligence is one of them, the, the, the ability to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And he just does that. You know, and again, in the book, I talk about why you know, that seems to be on God's radar, you know, that he enjoys doing that with his, with his uh, imagers. Uh, but it's important. But they're just little differences. It's not Milton's paradise lost. Mm -hmm. It's something quite different and when you start to pick out the differences they bleed into lots of other passages in both testaments. Yeah, the thing that I find interesting is is that you know, the again just the kind of 30,000 feet overview is the way this often gets talked about is is that God's a relational God in the Old Testament. He makes covenant with His people. But the angel of the Lord is kind of one way He shows up. He doesn't show up directly very often. I mean the burning bush is kind of a cameo mm -hmm. appearance and that kind of thing. But there but uh, but as, you, as God becomes more transcendent in some aspects of Second Temple Judaism, the question is, well, then who does all the mechanizations that mm -hmm. makes the earth run right. and if you're going to believe that there's a whole other realm? And, and this, this angelic and demonic world gets developed. I don't know how else to describe it. You go to First Enoch. Early chapters of First Enoch, and of mm -hmm. course, as you know, um, you get lists of of names and and spheres of influence, etc. A whole uh, pantheon. It's not just a, I mean, it's a pantheon, but it's a full pantheon. I mean, they've got a hotel room full of of <laughs> angels and demons that are working here. And in the midst of that, um, what you're seeing is how does God administer this creation? Well, He does it through this through the mechanization and the activity of all these all these figures who are now named and identified. So that when we come to the New Testament, we're talking about principalities and powers over which Jesus sits. We know what we're talking about. Yeah, that, I think the whole patron angel idea mm -hmm. is really important and it really tracks back into the Old Testament into Genesis. Mm -hmm. and it, everybody knows the story of the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what they don't pick up on is Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. okay, if, if you have an ESV, again the ESV has this right because it incorporates Dead Sea Scroll material into the running translation. Mm -hmm. But it says when the Most High, again we know who that is, mm -hmm. divided up the nations, Okay, we mm -hmm. know when that happened. Mm -hmm. He divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Mm -hmm. But Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his inheritance. Mm -hmm. Now, what you have going on there, especially if you look at the, the flip side of it mm -hmm. in Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20, mm -hmm. you have God essentially saying, well, look at what's going on here at Babel. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we reiterated the, the Genesis covenant here, the, the cultural mandate, dominion mandate, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it, after the flood. And they're supposed to disperse, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Instead, they build a ziggurat, this temple mm -hmm. to call down the deity, to localize the deity. Mm -hmm. But Yahweh will not be tamed. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, 
okay, you don't want to obey me. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to give you a taste of what you're, you're asking for. Mm -hmm. So he divides up the nations, disperses them, and allots them to sons of God, to mm -hmm. lesser Elohim, lesser divine beings, mm -hmm. and then vice versa. They're essentially sort of married to the nations mm -hmm. as well. And that's the Old Testament explanation for where we get pantheons, mm -hmm. why the nations worship other gods. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if you look at Psalm 82, mm -hmm. the whole thing sort of goes sour. Mm -hmm. And so it, it explains the hostility as well. Mm -hmm. and, and just that little tidbit mm -hmm. informs so much of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, all these, you know, why do, the, why do the Philistine priests, you know, in the Temple of Dagon after that episode, why do they tiptoe around the threshold? Mm -hmm. Because now it's, it's Yahweh's turf. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to Dagon anymore. There's mm -hmm. this sense that certain ground is assigned, certain ground belongs, is under dominion mm -hmm. to certain, you know, divine beings. Mm -hmm. Israel against the nations, you know, Yahweh against the gods. It's just the whole story of the rest of the, of, of the Old Testament. You get, get it played out in Daniel. Mm -hmm. That's the passage that typically evangelicals are familiar with, mm -hmm. with this sort of marrying an entity to a national mm -hmm. you know, piece of turf. Right. But that filters into Paul's vocabulary. You know, why is it, I mean, Paul does use the word demon occasionally mm -hmm. in 1 Corinthians 10, but look at the other terms he uses. You know, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, mm -hmm. rulers, authorities, they're all, they're all dominion terms. They're mm -hmm. all, in fact, geographical dominion terms mm -hmm. outside, you know, of, of the Pauline context mm -hmm. that he's using these things in. And that, that's because Paul understands what, how the world works. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I try to show in Unseen Realm is that Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, had this deep sense that the Old Testament said that after God did this, there was still the covenant with Abraham, Le leaves the door open a crack mm -hmm. to redeem them. And you know, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so we're trying to kickstart the kingdom of God, spread the good rule of God to the nations. Doesn't quite work, but you get to Isaiah 66, mm -hmm. these eschatological visions of this mm -hmm. is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so then we get Pentecost, and Pentecost is a very obvious sort of, sort of starts to reverse the process to, right. to extract believers from all the nations and cover all these territories. And Paul looks at himself and says, God's chosen me to be the mechanism to get this done. And so he, he, he's very conscious. He, I love when he writes to the Romans. You know, he knows he's going to Jerusalem, and the, the Spirit's told him, bad things are going to happen to you. <laughs> right, right. And he's like, I still have to go. Yeah. I know that I'm going. Yeah. And so he goes there, gets arrested, because, because he, yeah. he wants to get to Rome. Right. So he, he's on the ship to Rome. He writes to the Romans and says, hey, I can't wait to see you guys. <laughs> but, but I'm only going to see you in passing uh -huh. because I need to go to Spain. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... It's Spain and, and Tarshish, you know, mm -hmm. are, are in alignment there. I know that that's disputed, but again, yeah. look, look at all the, all the data there. In fact, the one, one source that I really didn't get to put into the book because it, it just got published by John Day talks about how the reason Tarshish is grouped under Japheth is because it was under Greek control, you know, at the time mm -hmm. of the composition. But it's still the westernmost point. Mm -hmm. But Paul has his, in his consciousness, look, I have to get to that place because that's the, that's the last place in the table of nations that has not heard the gospel. Mm. And so it's like, then, then I'm done. Then yeah. the Lord can come back and then yeah. I'll die. You know, I mean, he has this sense of, of reversing this whole situation where earth is under dominion of unseen hostile beings. But, you know, in evangelicalism, we don't really, we don't look at our Old Testament that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't let the, that sort of framework guide our thinking and interpretation in a, in a host of passages. So that's one of the things I'm trying to do in the book, to, to show where that thought system works its way out into all sorts of places. Okay, let me ask you, I have time for one more question. Let me ask you this, and this is a hard question to ask you, but I'll try it. You, you say, there are a handful of passages that you say people are, uh, should be aware of how they should be read versus how they're normally read. Give me two or three of those, sure. and, and, and what do you think they tell us? Because you say there's a payoff as well. So Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you an Old Testament example. It, 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 it's sort of a favorite of mine, but the Elisha story with mm -hmm. Naaman the leper. Mm -hmm. So Naaman, of course, you know, has leprosy, and he's, the little girl says, hey, go over to Israel, I, you know, the prophet mm -hmm. will heal you. So he does. Mm -hmm. He goes over, and Elisha won't even meet him. Mm -hmm. And he just says, well, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and he gets ticked off. And mm -hmm. he doesn't want to do it. He gets mm -hmm. talked into doing it, and then mm -hmm. he's healed mm -hmm. when he does it. So 
he, he's grateful. He's now I know, you yeah. know that your God is the God of all gods. And what does he ask the prophet to take back? He asks for dirt. Mm -hmm. He says, can I load my mule with as much dirt as the thing can <laughs> carry? And, and you look at that and you go, well, that's kind of weird. It, yeah. It's actually not weird. Yeah. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't say how he's going to use it, but he says, now look, I'm an important guy, mm -hmm. and I work with the king, and we got to go into the temple of Ramon, and I got to help him in there because he's old. He might, you know, tip over or whatever. So then he asks for dirt. So the supposition is that he has this sense mm -hmm. that I need holy ground with me to mm -hmm. protect me because mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm aligned with Yahweh now. Mm -hmm. And so it's this sort of, this is the best I can do because I don't like live how here. How to stay connected. Right, how to stay connected. So, you know, I'm, I'm a Syrian. What else can I do? Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's a good illustration of, again, how the worldview mm -hmm. sort of connects. You know, David, when he gets kicked out of Judah, he's, mm -hmm. you know, sitting there lamenting, well, how can, I, how can I pray now? How can I do this? It's not a denial of omnipresence, mm -hmm. okay? It's just this sense that for me to commune with the God of Israel, I need to be in that place. Mm -hmm. Again, this sacred space, that whole idea. Mm. You know, you, you go to the New Testament, and it depends on, you know, obviously manuscript data. Mm -hmm. What does Jesus do when he sort of launches his campaign, you know, for the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. He sends out the 70 or mm -hmm. the 72. It depends. Both right. references go back to the Tower of Babel, the Table of Nations, yep. depending on your, whether, whether you're reading the Septuagint or the MT. Right. And, but it means the same thing. It's like, look. We're reclaiming all this stuff mm -hmm. because it's mine. Mm -hmm. It belongs to me, and I'm here to get it. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it just looks so random, but it fits into a worldview. Mm -hmm. You know, where Jesus goes and what he says when he's there, you know, really, really matters uh, because of, the, again, what we call cosmic geography. Mm -hmm. all, the, all these places have a backdrop. They have a history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole Bashan, the region of Bashan, if you go back into uh, Deuteronomy 2 and 3, Rudy's sort of familiar with, oh, that, this is where they fought the Rephaim and they killed off Og and Sion and all that stuff. Well, that's true, but there are two places mentioned that they, where they lived, Ashtaroth and Edrai in the region of Bashan. Well, Bashan is also the region of the cult site of Dan, mm -hmm. which later happens to be Pan or Panyas mm -hmm. or Banyas, mm -hmm. which is where, of course, Jesus goes and says, upon this rock. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and my view is that, you know, I know the Catholics have their view, the Protestants have their view because yeah. it's not Catholic. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, think, I think Jesus actually meant what he said. Mm -hmm. Okay, this place mm -hmm. for millennia, mm -hmm. you know, has been associated with the gateway to the bad place, the mm -hmm. gateway to the realm of the dead, mm -hmm. okay, because of the Rephaim association. It's upon this place I'm going to build my rock. I'm going to make this place Satan's tomb. Mm -hmm. And, and he, it, it's, a, it's a daring thing to say. And then later he goes to with the Mount of Transfiguration, mm -hmm. which if you look at the chronology, it's probably Hermon, Bashan. Mm -hmm. It's a few days' journey. Mm -hmm. It's the only mountain there. Yeah, yeah. And Hermon, Book of mm -hmm. Enoch and, yeah. and other places, really bad association for cosmic geography. And he's like, hey, I'm here. Look, look who I am. And then at that point, he turns and says, okay, we need to go to Jerusalem. And the, and the, and the Gospels say it was at this point that he began to talk to them about his death. Mm -hmm. So he goes to bait them mm -hmm. because what needs to happen is he needs to die. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the trigger event for the kingdom of God to start rolling again because it's going to be followed by the resurrection and all that. And I take seriously what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. Had the rulers of this world known mm -hmm. you know, what the result would have been, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm -hmm. So I think Jesus goes there and he baits the powers that be, so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. And then he turns around and says, okay, Time to die. Mm -hmm. He goes there, tri triumphal entry. A week later, he's dead. Right. You know, uh, but all these things again have have background, you know, and, and history, and, and a lot of it is theological history. A lot of it is again spiritual history, again the the unseen realm, you know, kind of idea. These things that sort of operate in the background that we aren't necessarily aware of uh, unless we were sort of had their world in our head. Yeah, the thing that strikes me about all this is there is a running narrative that's running through the whole of Scripture. Sometimes you get people who are skeptical about the Bible who will say, oh, it's 66 books and, you know, dozens of authors and there's no coherence to it all. And then going there, going, there's a it, depth it, it coherence. It is so intelligent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, just take, take a look at the number of authors in the stretch of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes 
you have, and it's not just one or two, oh, a verb tense here, a little, little play on words there. It's five, 10, 15 things sort of converging mm -hmm. in one place, then over here. And it, how do you pull that off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, how do you pull that off? Yeah. You know, and my view in the unseen realm is look, everybody has their interpretations of all these weird passages. I get that, mm -hmm. I know that, I've read the literature, I, mm -hmm. you know, I understand it. But what I'm trying to convince people of is sometimes the best interpretation is the one that not only works right there, mm -hmm. but that also informs your reading in half a dozen other places. That's right. Makes and for so, coherence. Right. And, and, and a lot of those sort of situations really fall by the wayside or mm -hmm. aren't appreciated because we, uh, the Old Testament people are guilty of this yeah, more than yeah, you guys. Yeah. We strip uh -huh. the supernatural stuff uh -huh. out of the text uh -huh. in an Old Testament passage. Mm -hmm. And then we come up with something that works, yeah. but it just kills it right there. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just, I, I reject that kind of thinking. Yeah, you know, I'm a supernaturalist. And yeah. I call it divide and conquer text. You strip them out of their context and all of a sudden you lose all these links that you have right. in the process. Right. And the, the ancient person, the reader, the writer, they just had this stuff going off in their heads. They mm -hmm. understood the links. Yeah. And we don't, and when we cut them off, we're never gonna recover them. Yeah. Unless we have, the, in some cases, the courage to go back and say, well, you know, this is the way an ancient person really would have read this, yeah. and let's read it that way and see what happens. Yeah, you're reacquainting us with the cultural context in which these passages are functioning and then showing how there is a story that's running through that's between books that's really fascinating. So it's a very valuable um, contribution and read, and I appreciate your taking the time to talk with us about, about, about the unseen realm. Hopefully the yeah. book will not be unseen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, wouldn't that be ironic? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. You're welcome.